What's good, everybody? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by DistroKid. They are the go-to for digital music distribution and the easiest way for musicians to get their music onto Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, TikTok, YouTube, and more. They offer unlimited uploads, and artists keep 100% of their earnings. Getting your music onto platforms and into stores 10 to 20 times faster than any other distributor. They help with cover song clearance, automatic splits, and they offer all kinds of tools and templates to help you get the most visibility for your releases. I dig this company and appreciate their business model that offers more features and tools than any other distributor while doing it at the most affordable price for solo artists, bands, DJs, studio artists, and any other creators that are making music or producing music in their home, and they offer label services as well. They've got three different tiers that they offer to creators that start as low as $22.99 a year. That's just $1.92 a month. And even their top tier is only $7.50 per month. And the best part about DistroKid sponsoring the podcast is they are offering Dan Cable Presents listeners 30% off their first year of service with DistroKid, making their affordable prices even cheaper for you. I will put that discount link in the episode notes. It will also be in my Instagram bio. Big shout out to DistroKid for sponsoring this podcast for more than three years now. Much appreciated. Now let's get into the episode. What is happening, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dan Cable Presents Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the program once again. If this is your first time listening, thanks for checking out the show. You can find fresh episodes coming at you every Tuesday. And if you want to help support this thing in a free way, you can do so by clicking subscribe on iTunes, clicking write a review, giving the podcast five stars if you feel like it is deserving of so. And that will help propel this thing into the tops of those iTunes charts, giving it more visibility on the national and international levels, helping strangers find the podcast. Just a great way to contribute to the growth and sustainability of this thing. Appreciate the hell out of all the folks that have already taken the time to do so. If you're not listening on Apple, just hit like, follow, subscribe, wherever you are listening from. Give it five stars on Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe there. Check out the monthly playlist that I've been dropping every first of the month. Links for those will be in the episode notes. Hope everybody is doing well out there. Stoked to get in to episode 426 with Portland-based band Maita, which is the writing project of a singer-songwriter, Maria Maita Kepler. She's a killer songwriter, and uh, this band has been around the Portland music scene for many years now, and they've put out some really great records, including a brand new one called Want that just recently dropped. It's my favorite record that Maita has put out thus far and maria is just such a good songwriter love her vocal delivery and the way she is able to fit words into lines and just her her turns of phrases and she's just got this really great band around her that just uh really helped build these songs out and uh yeah just can't say enough good things about this new record wants and i'm stoked that i got to have maria back on the podcast she came on the podcast a long time ago just before the pandemic took us all by storm it was like episode 190 and i'm stoked that i got to have her on nearly 250 episodes later and uh even though i had a lot of conversations under my belt at that time, I uh, I think I was still trying to find the right questions at times or the right ways to pivot when I wasn't uh, feeling like I was doing a great job from the jump and maybe uh, didn't always feel like I had a grip on uh, the conversation in a way that gave me the ability to, to facilitate it in, uh, in a good way all the time. So I think my first chat with Maria was it was cool. But um, I went into this one really wanting to tap into a conversation with Maria that gave her the opportunity to 
share her approach to songwriting and uh, to talk about the band's new record and and not so much me just firing questions at her and i just loved what she had to say and uh the things we got into during this chat just really enjoyed it and uh felt like i was able to get to know her a bit more through this particular chat so big thanks to maria for taking the time to chat with me if you're new to mita i suggest that you go and check out this entire catalog of music especially if you uh, enjoy what is featured in this particular episode but uh definitely go check out that new record want and all the links will be in the episode notes so you can keep up with mita if you are in the portland oregon area Maita is having their album release show on December 13th at Mississippi Studios, one of the coolest music venues in this city. I will definitely be planning to be at that one, and you can get tickets for that show right now, and you can get that new record, Want, on vinyl via Fluff and Gravy Records, one of, uh, one of the coolest local Portland record labels in the city. And uh, just some incredible artists, including Maita and Anna Tivill and Jeffrey Martin. Uh, Fluff and Gravy just doesn't really uh, miss with uh, what they put out. It's, uh, it's really well curated. And yeah, just some, some great records coming out of Fluff and Gravy. So trust your label, Fluff and Gravy. Uh, and the links for Fluff and Gravy will also be in the episode notes and with all of that we are going to get into this thing episode 426 with Maita and kicking off the episode with a track from that want record this one is called waking up at night there's also a music video for it now let's do the damn thing waking up at night again getting my meds right again Walking out the light again Starting all my fights again Burning up my frame again Dancing with that flame again Swearing off his name again Going through the pain again Doing what I should again Trying to feel good again Don't know if I could I'm so to be here. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah. The, your new want record is uh, my favorite Maita music that has come out of your, your catalog thus far. And it's been just like super heavy in the rotation. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to like kick things off, can you just talk about the record and like maybe where it comes from emotionally? Mm-hmm. Um, this record feels to me like our most cohesive record out of the the Maita ones and I think what it was is I I wrote these songs a lot of them during the pandemic when there wasn't a lot of other stuff going on um we just had to stay inside and had these walls that we could stare at all day and I think it offered in an environment where a lot of emotions and memories could percolate and ended up writing these intense songs um, that I found to be pretty, uh, I guess, raw and emotional. And I felt like they were the most courageous batch of songs that I've written, where I was really trying to not shy away from the meat of whatever I was exploring in each particular song. Yeah, And they ended up all circling this idea of desire and what it means to be someone in a long-term partnership and how how do you navigate desire as that changes over the years and just the subtleties of of being in a steady relationship situation it's so easy to write songs about um you know little breakups and little like interactions that you have with 
with new relationships, but I think to be able to continue to write about something is really challenging and, uh, and we don't hear a lot about it. Yeah. And so Want explores that a lot amongst other things as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you don't always hear people maybe like writing about the mundane things happening in the a day-to-day mm-hmm. relationship or... Totally. And I think for me, what I've always found interesting is in the most mundane uh, scenarios, there's often a very... Uh, interesting and fiery desire core that's like underneath all of that yeah it comes usually from a place of desperation for something to be different or uh remembering when things weren't were more exciting or just um feeling unsure about what you're doing yeah i think as i get older the the mundane lyrics or you know the things that like reference just the walk to the coffee shop in the morning seem to be the things that like attract me the most mm-hmm. in some way. Yeah. I think that sometimes simplicity is more effective than complexity and there's a relatability to the normal things that fill our lives and act as this backdrop to the stories that we're telling to ourselves inside of our brains. <laughs> yeah. And I would imagine you're just like, I don't know, just kind of stuck in that place. Like during the pandemic, like you're just, if you're, you're talking about a relationship, like living with a partner during, during that time. And yeah, everything is mag- magnified for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, what do you think allowed you at, at this point to, to be maybe more courageous than you ever had been as far as like approaching certain subject matters? Every record helps me, I think, do that more and more. It's just an exercise, like a muscle that you exercise, in my case, where uh, it just takes practice. And every time I think that's something that I, I don't think I could share that or write about that, that's when I'm like, that's probably what I should write about. And I feel like with my songwriting, I just am trying to push farther and farther outwards as I get older. So this felt like a natural progression from the last two records. Yeah. Is it uh, something you actively have to push back against a little bit? Like when you, uh, when you do feel like you've, you've hit the uncomfortable point and that's like where the juice is like, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it can be really hard to, yeah sometimes you just write something and you're like oh that is the truth but I don't know if I how I feel about saying it out loud and one of the amazing things about music is that there's a little bit of a buffer and that's our melody and our production and it turns no matter how personal of a story you're telling it really does add a little bit of a cushion to what you're saying and it it makes something personal more universal because people can feel it in their bodies and in in their ears and they maybe they something in it resonates with them that's not just words so you're it's like all it's a package deal (laughs) right yeah absolutely I think that's like what I've always been attracted to like your music for and maybe specifically with this record is that there's like so there's there's just these these very heavy raw moments of instrumentation that like really let you maybe experience the full range of emotions that yeah. you're like experiencing through listening to the song thank you yeah it's definitely the non-verbal part of the record is really important to me as someone who can i feel like my lyrics have been in the past more wordy Uh, I'm trying to whittle it down to certain moments. There's definitely moments on this record where I kind of go off and say a bunch of words. (laughs) But um, I was so excited when we started to expand the Maita band sound to be louder and and more um, powerful coming from a singer-songwriter solo perspective. And that tool was just so exciting for me to be able to all of a sudden communicate something that you're going to feel in your whole body and you're, it's almost overwhelming and it's something that I can't do just by myself. Yeah. Um, 
is it now when you're writing, are you writing with like knowing that there is going to be a band behind you and that you can explore outside of just the, maybe the core of the the bones of the song? Like, is that in your head now? Totally. I mean, it, I think in a certain way it, it always was just because when I would perform solo and write songs for solo uh solo right you know solo performing i felt kind of insecure about just letting the words be there without more to carry them and i felt like people weren't just going to want to sit and listen to me play three chords and sing words uh that i wrote and so i've always built in like an epic build and like a crescendo and a um song structures like like a hook and a bridge I've always built those into my songs feeling like there needs to be some kind of cathartic climax to every piece of work that I created just because I was like I don't want to bore people with my words and the that's why like for me it was so natural when we discovered that this sound was actually going to be a lot bigger which happened when we were recording our very first record with our band um we just showed up to try playing these songs without much of a a vision in mind and it was just like oh this is yeah this is what it's going to be like and it just fit very naturally with what i was already doing yeah um so can you like kind of see those moments a little bit more when you're writing now that you're a few records into yeah yeah, for sure, for sure. I love it, and I love I love a good drop. I love, like, a very quiet to very loud. Yeah. And knowing those tools are so accessible now is, is really exciting, and it's a lot more intuitive. Do you enjoy playing the songs solo as well when you have those opportunities? And does for, that for feel, sure. like, really different to you? It does. It does. I, I love a balance. What I really love about a solo performance is, is the power to change your set list and jump around a lot and just have a lot of freedom with what you're doing based on the vibe and i think being able to curate these songs completely like feeding off of what the audience seems to be wanting and what you are wanting to play based on what you're getting back um that's my favorite part of performing solo is that flexibility are you uh, are you thinking about that when you're writing, like how they will translate to you just playing solo, or are you usually like writing acoustically anyways, and it feels like it's going to make sense later? Yeah, I just write them acoustically anyways, and you know there are some songs I write um, where I'm like, I think this isn't going to pack as much of a punch without the band, and I know that as I'm writing it, but I can envision the band. But then sometimes later I play those songs for people and then they're like we we like it like as is as well and that's the that's the other thing about writing is you th- might think you're writing a certain kind of song and then you play it for someone and they're like oh like th- like that song is is xyz like I, you're so close to it when you're writing yeah i need that sounding board to help me figure out what what each song is going to be for sure do you feel like the um things getting heavy and you know maybe the the back and forth of the the quiet moments and the loud moments is like also pretty reflective of like what you enjoy listening to. Definitely. Yeah. I I write the kind of music that I want to listen to and I'm pretty picky with my music. I love an album that has a bunch of different kinds of songs on it where it's not just one sound the entire way through. Yeah. I don't really like the background like dinner party sort of albums where they're really pleasant to put on and I mean I love having those to put on in the background the coffee a, record yeah like those records I mean they sound that sound really beautiful where you can be like I can walk away and there's not going to be a song on here that's going to be too abrasive or intense yeah no matter what you're doing like there, I ha- there's so many beautiful records that I do enjoy for that purpose but in terms of the music that I actually when I'm alone and blasting it in the car yeah it's always there's always this big emotional arc and i just love a surprise i love dynamics i love intensity yeah i that's exactly what i love about the want record is you know just listening it's it's hard to like predict where it's going Mm -hmm. you know even the songs that might start off quiet might just break into those those really loud abrasive moments at times which is 
great, but it also feels like it never loses sight of like the song that it's built upon, if that that's makes sense. Cool. Yeah, that's definitely the goal. We don't want to do anything because just to, for the sake of doing it, right? We yeah. want it because it fits with the story. And I think actually we recorded the whole record minus um, Waking Up at Night, which we did very, very last minute and added. Um, and I would listen to this record front to back and just feel like it was almost too intense. Like sometimes I was like, I don't know, is this too intense? Is this too exhausting, this record? And we very strategically like placed a couple like kind of palate cleanser songs in there. Like at a bad time is just pretty low like energy the whole time but yeah. I, I do love that song and then um the little like interlude was very purposefully created for that reason and the one acoustic song without any drums on it we just we were like we have to build in yeah these moments for people to kind of like breathe after these intense songs yeah i think it's nice to have like those moments for the people that are listening front to back mm -hmm. to just you know give them an opportunity to maybe just process what's what's happening exactly. along the way exactly. or i've grown to love interludes so much because they seem to really like build help build the world of mm -hmm. a record mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah they don't do super it's so funny interludes are so short and everything is for streaming these days yeah. right so like you look at streams and like interludes are always skipped like there's like zero <laughs> plays on the interlude which is fine but i i agree with you like there's something really cool about getting the whole experience i think those are like really fun tracks to throw into playlists actually mm -hmm. also because right. they they almost were they can like work within so many different mixes of songs yeah yeah totally you just toss a random interlude That's true. in there yeah totally it's kind of fun yes um so do you spend a lot of time with the sequencing with this record mm -hmm. yeah yeah we went back and forth a lot we think a lot about um kind of we try to make sure there's almost like two records based on the side a side b situation of a vinyl and yeah. so we want the opener of each side to be an opener okay. we want the closer of each side to be like a mini closer and like the break to make a lot of sense um the other factor though is that like i tend to every album we've released has had like 11 full songs on it and so we always are pushing up against that like time limit yeah um so that's a limitation but we've spent a lot of time on sequencing and we just put things in playlists and like forget it walk away from them put them on the car try to figure out what makes sense yeah yeah do you think that limitation you know thinking about like the amount of time you have for a vinyl do you think that limitation can be helpful as well like do you find like creative parameters to be helpful in your your songwriting at all i i actually really do like working within restrictions i think it makes me it challenges me and it it draws out a lot of uh interesting choices i do a lot of song like whenever i write with prompts for songwriting i always get really cool resu results because sometimes i look at everything and i'm like i don't know what where to begin yeah and then to have a starting point um and to like think about the most creative way to execute something that is a parameter that's really cool to me uh so with this situation i think i wouldn't want it to be any longer for a record personally i feel like i need it to be there needs to be a limit to like how long a project is for me just because i do think people get tired and it, it get, can get exhausting <laughs> to go through <laughs> a whole you know and so um I think the natural length of a vinyl is perfect for me. Yeah, I think it like gives you maybe the opportunity to like want to listen to it again. Maybe if you didn't, if you didn't feel like you quite got enough, yeah. you know, it's not like crazy to throw it on again. And maybe like you're listening to it back to back with, you know, in an hour, like yeah. in change. So mm -hmm. I think I found myself like the last few days, just kind of listening to the record more in depthly. It just, like letting it I, I i usually have my my spotify set up till like the record just loops and oh, cool. sometimes yeah. you just like don't notice it's like oh it, it started over again I'm yeah like mm -hmm. two tracks in again <laughs> mm -hmm. well and we thought about that too we were like how the last song to the first song does that feel good like yeah. we, we thought about it all <laughs> like we want it to all make sense i like that 
because it's it's a part of some people's listening experience mm-hmm. at this point you know yes just even making like a monthly playlist i'm always like thinking about how that last song is going to wrap around back to mm-hmm. that first one for mm-hmm. sure um do you have uh a lot of like routine writing practices are you someone that likes to try to sit down every day or do a certain amount of writing mm, no i well actually at the beginning of this year i did like a 52 songwriter club so okay. i was writing a song a week based on a prompt that yeah, i yeah. received on a sunday is that the through like the pdx songwriters yes i'm friends with sam pinkerton who, yeah. who does runs that and created that i believe and uh, I made it to like week seven, I think, which felt great. I was like seven songs. And then, um, you know, winter's kind of a slow time. Yeah. We left winter and I was just like so too busy. <laughs> and a lot of stuff was happening in my life where like emotionally I felt like I couldn't really s- change to like whatever prompt I, I got just because I was like, I don't, I need to be thinking about something else right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's always an ebb and flow. Like I, I'll like kind of write a bunch of songs in a period of time and then I won't write any songs for like several months and then I'll write a bunch of songs. I I need a little time to digest my life before I can put it all down. Yeah. It feels like you've had maybe a lot of experiences where you've had these records that are maybe like done for a long time and, (laughs) and don't come out for a while what is that experience been like for you is it super frustrating or have you just kind of come to accept it because you've done it a few times it's always frust- it's always frustrating especially if you're not expecting it to be that way and i think just the nature of like working with labels and scheduling everything and slotting your your album in amongst like so many other ones that's just how it goes we are used to the idea of delaying a record so that is is not the the biggest thing in the world to us and i think one thing we do is we're very strategic about the songs we play live so an album might be finished for a year or two years but we don't we try not to play any of the songs on tour from that record if they're not out yet because we just don't want to become sick of them before um we have to actually tour on those songs yeah so We want, and we want the audience to like be like have a fresh batch of songs when those come out. So, I, uh, so the live perform, like, I'm so excited to play this new record live. You know, there's a couple songs that we haven't even learned yet from it because we haven't had our official like album release tour stuff happen. And it's been so cool to just arrange them live after recording them so long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, that must be nice to like, I don't know, preserve some of the freshness for for you if you have been sitting on them so long and find some way to be like super excited about them. Oh yeah, again, definitely. Yeah. Does it uh, is it kind of wild to make a record of of songs you haven't really played live much? Like, do you feel like they they do? just kind of naturally change in some ways when you when you do get in the room to do these rehearsals I think they always do naturally change because there's so much more space on a record to to put stuff with and also like touring we have to strip things down to make sure we can afford to be on the road so we yeah. can't bring like a six piece six right piece right band um but we're trying we we just really do love the way this record sounds we we are really proud of it and stoked on it we're doing our very best to be very faithful to the record on this round naturally as we take these songs on the road they they are going to evolve i know they're going to evolve but um we're, we're doing our damnedest yeah yeah uh do you reserve like any thoughts like while you are making a record then to think about how they will translate live when you're thinking about the production that's being added or is it always just like let's make the best song we can in the studio and mm-hmm. then we'll figure it out yeah that's it's it's the latter yeah definitely we we just it, we're trying to just i think we're pretty in the moment when we're recording um and yeah we've layered like three drum parts over each you know we just we don't even 
think about that stuff and we just trust that uh, things will work out live. And if the song sounds different, that's totally fine. I personally love it when the live show is different from the album. Like it's it's interesting to me. Yeah. I've seen bands play that were incredible bands. The record was incredible and they the live show was exactly as incredible as the record, but everything was exactly the same and sounded the same. Yeah. Which is cool, but I was honestly a little bit bored and I like I don't know. It Yes. <laughs> I I agree. I think that there's like I think that my thing and something I've talked about on episodes is that as long as it doesn't feel like there's anything missing, like then I think it's great, Mm -hmm. you know, but like finding other ways to make sounds happen on the record is like, it's fun to watch like a guitar player play a synth line maybe, Mm -hmm. or like vice versa. And like, you're going to get a little bit different sound out of that. Or I remember the first time I saw your band, it was like a Ron Tom Sunday session. Uh I'd never seen your band live. And I was just like, pretty blown away about how big and loud it yeah. got you know and like i feel like that must that's always a part of the thing too is like those loud moments on the record i'm sure are even heavier live they're just kind of kind of like have to be right and i think our first record too our first couple or definitely our first one um didn't have as like intense like there's a lot of songs on there that if you heard them you'd be like this band's a folk band and if you had heard only those songs that's what you would think of us yeah and so because we like to have a lot of different variation in our songs that happens um sometimes where people will be like my to the folk project (laughs) and it's which is fine but they're also going to get some loud stuff yeah in their way if they don't know that you're not just a folk project by now they haven't been paying attention (laughs) well yeah yeah perhaps weight off your shoulders or a different kind of release with um, emotionally putting these songs out being that they are maybe the most courageous or honest in some ways or does it feel any different in that way um i would say that i don't really feel too much of a release if anything it almost i don't know it's just we heard the songs so much when we were mixing it that at this point like we we feel really stoked to put them out and just share them with the world because we're excited about them and playing them live i think you kind of churn up a lot of the emotions over again um and like dig into like what made you write them and then like perform them in this way that is like passionate and like uh follows the trajectory of whatever the album lyrics are but i guess I don't know. It's almost like I feel like now we've kind of stirred up a bunch of stuff and I, I, I'm like, there's a lot more I can write about now. I think I don't feel like, oh, now I'm done with that chapter. It yeah. almost feels like we can, there's more to say, but I don't know like, yeah. where that'll go yet. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, I don't know is there like an extra layer of like vulnerability like playing these songs for you at all or does that feel relatively the same as any other songs you've played in the past as well i uh hmm i think anytime i've performed songs that are vulnerable i again like get to hide behind that cushion of the music and the performance yeah and i I, I maybe it's not that I don't like feel the lyrics as I'm singing them I do but I get so used to it that it doesn't I'm not like shy about you know I don't feel like oh this is so private like yeah. I'm sharing it at that point I've kind of transitioned into this is the performance and 
I will say though, like you never know how things are going to hit you. Like maybe you didn't sleep enough. Maybe you're feeling particularly emotional that day. Maybe something happened earlier that upset you and on stage something might hit you. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you're like, whoa, it might be the hundredth time you perform the song. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, I really felt that today. Yeah. Music is very interesting like that. Mm -hmm. You know, just even songs that you don't write of just like songs you listen to. It's just like oh, a yeah. particular day it can yeah. hit you like whoa <laughs> totally totally yeah it's it's wild yeah and i don't know it, it, i guess that like makes sense too from a performance standpoint because i'm always like i'm always curious you know when people are writing these very emotional songs it's like when you have to go perform this song on tour every night like is this keeping you kind of like locked in this place or you know or I mean, does yeah. it just become part of the performance, like you're saying? You know? I, for me, it softens the blow, you know, of whatever it is that you're singing. Um, at that point, I, I'm not thinking about like whatever, like, it, I mean, for the most part, I don't want to say that I'm not thinking about it, but it's it turns into a song of yeah. its own. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. What is it like for you towing the line of, you know, maybe writing about things are that are like very specific to your life experience but maybe not being so hyper specific so that you can maintain some mystery there or so that it's not so on the nose that's a good question i feel well one one of the things that i do is i jump around time a lot um and sometimes i jump around perspectives a lot so maybe I'm writing within the framework of an event that happened six or seven years ago that I, for some reason, am remembering today because something reminded me, yeah. you know, like, like sadness and anger and regret and all of those things are so nonlinear sometimes. Yeah. So um, I can feel something that is not a very recent story uh that and that offers a little bit of protection and space there or writing from another person's perspective i like to do that a lot to just create a little bit of of distance and also just it unearths a new opportunity for for that song and that story and i do sprinkle in things that maybe aren't fully true or that they're hy hyperbolic or yeah. whatever the opposite of hyperbolic you know like it's just like you I stretch the truth sometimes or I add in a detail or two that that maybe just felt right, but isn't necessarily the real story. Yeah, I think that's part of being a good writer mm -hmm. is knowing when those moments are to, to do so, you know, totally. yeah, is a part of it also just uh, maybe understanding that your life experiences sometimes involve other people and wanting to like that you're maybe not always just sharing a, a personal experience or that you're sharing somebody else's in some way? Well, I mean, that is definitely something you have to think about with songwriting because you might end up like hurting people or them feeling upset about what you like that. I think about that a lot, the responsibility of that. Um, but I think just based on if you are writing the song, it is going to be from your perspective, no matter if you, who story you're telling. Yeah. And if anything, I feel like it's like you need that disclaimer of like, these are based on true events, but they're not, it's, it is a fictionalized, like you kind of have to, I, whenever I write from another person's perspective, I release the accuracy of this, you know, I, yeah. I'm like, I can't claim to know anything. Yes. And at that point, it's an exercise that, but it's, it turns into my story in a lot of ways. Just, and that's just because I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth or like pretend that I know what they're going through. And like, I I don't know. It's just like, yes, there are other people involved in these stories, but at that point they are characters because I, I'm not, you know, I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I was watching your your KEXP earlier today, and I loved hearing you talk about ex wife and like how mm -hmm. that particular song came about of like, oh yeah, writing this song for, about someone you really hadn't met, right? Mm -hmm. And just like examining like what the other side of this relationship <laughs> might 
feel like totally that you only get to hear one side of all mm-hmm. the time yeah i love doing that i think that's a really uh i think a, it's a, such a common um songwriting tool for a reason and i also think a lot of times that perspective that's not told historically has been like the woman's perspective and that's something that i really connect with and find fascinating and i am also a woman and i have a yeah. you know sometimes like i don't say as much as i should or could and songwriting has been that place where i can do that yeah it's uh yeah i think it's nice to i'm sure that like challenges you in some way to to reach outside of your own perspective Mm -hmm. definitely it's kind of nice too you're just like i'm tired of my brain (laughs) like i want to pretend to be someone else for a second yeah i would imagine that's like part of like maybe forcing the creativity or like those song prompts that you Mm -hmm. were talking about yeah yeah, I think it, it hopefully like adds depth to the thing too. Yeah, I think and you always learn something. You know, every song I learn a little something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it is it uh, a part of the songwriting as far as like when you are expressing your your personal feelings? When you uh, you kind of like talked about earlier, just like with this record, really saying the things that maybe you shied away from uh-huh. in the past or. Mm-hmm. Is it uh, is it one of those things of like once you acknowledge it through the songwriting, like a personal feeling that you're you have, like you also have to like face that thing, like if you're saying yeah. it out loud in some way. Definitely, and I, 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 you know, I grew up like I did the whole liberal arts thing. Whenever I write wrote essays, like I'd have to examine things from all sides and make sure I wasn't missing anything and that I was like covering all my bases and I I think a lot of times when I'm speaking even and having a conversation I'm like am I covering all my bases am I making a a fair assessment of the situation or if I get upset I try to make sure that am I is it within my rights to be upset like what is might the other person's perspective be what did they like I don't know I I really am careful with with everything I say and do to a fault I think but sometimes anyways so I do the same with my songs when I write a song and I'm trying to tell a story I'm like what why did I do this or why did they feel this way like what is the fair assessment of the situation or what's the real like like what's the motive here trying to understand it and then sometimes when I figure out what that is yeah it's like oh man like I feel bad that I did that (laughs) or you know like (laughs) I I was wrong there you know and then you're like all right I figured that out cool (laughs) (laughs) um I guess one thing I would caution though is like sometimes you do that and you write this song that's like self-deprecating in some way where you call attention to a blind spot of yours or or something that you did and I think the 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 risk with that is to just like kind of wash your hands and be like I I did it I I figured like I, I did the work, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I have, I was, I'm not perfect and I made this mistake, X, yeah. Y, Z, you know, and as this, you know, and then you're like, kind of try to, it's, you feel like you're like absolved of, of whatever wrongdoing. <laughs> and yeah. It's good to then also be like, it's not just the song you have to write. Like you have to also figure out what that means in real life. Like, yes. There's a real life application of that. <laughs> Yeah, that is very much, uh, yeah, a part of the thing of like, yes, you acknowledged (laughs) that you did the shitty thing. Like now, how are you going Mm -hmm. to like move through the world so you like don't do that again or, you you know, find ways to go about things in a better fashion? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not enough to just be like, yeah, I'm a piece of shit or like whatever, (laughs) you know, not me necessarily, but I've seen artists do that where they're like, I'm a, I am a not a nice person. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, and then they're like, but are you still not a nice person? You know, yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, for sure. (laughs) Like, what have you done? Are you just telling people about it and that makes it okay? (laughs) Are you still burning bridges? Yeah, exactly. It's like, that's not a good excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk to me about uh, the Japanese woodblock printing and like how that has uh shaped your your songwriting and maybe informed your lens for it that's so it's so interesting like i i um we talked about that in so you probably got that from the bio that that 
we had for maybe this, maybe. maybe yeah it was just really cool uh <laughs> and it was a really cool metaphor i think um because there's a lot of parallels which is the, like with songwriting or recording a record at least you do so much planning and writing and then um you make sure everything is exactly the way it should be and i i do that with my words i make sure it's everything is the right lyric yeah it's the right um like i don't really write throwaway songs i just kind of make sure every song is is to my ears perfect to me and woodblock printing is a lot of that as well like you it's less spontaneous. You really have to think everything through on the, on the front end. Um, what is it specific? Like what? You basically like, it's just every single color. You've probably seen, um, the, the wave, the famous, the wave with the Mount Fuji. Okay. Um, it's a very famous print. Um, and it looks like a painting and it's not, it's a, it's a wood block print. So every color you see is an individual piece of wood that where oh, everything wow. is carved away except the thing that is that color. And they use like these like water-based inks. So you can get a gradient, like kind of like a watercolor gradient print printed onto one of the blocks. You just have to like paint it in like a watercolor wash almost. Um, and I studied that in college and that's what I, I ended up doing my thesis on is is Japanese woodblock printmaking and obviously I'm a, a novice and I or amateur really <laughs> I don't I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in it and so the pieces are are more simple than what you would see in those like famous paintings but it's still so much work like I would yeah. carve like 12 blocks of wood for one piece of art and then have 12 colors uh, in that art and artwork and I've always been a visual artist that is something that I was doing even before I, I was playing music so it becomes another avenue for me to express emotion and storytelling I don't know how much like I don't do it really anymore yeah. like I kind of burnt myself out on it because it's extremely expensive to source all the the special wood yeah. and the paints and the paper and you need a lot of space to like carve and like wood shavings end up everywhere. It's just very time intensive. I'd love to go back to it at some point cause it's really cool. Um, but it's not like something I do all the time. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel like that? Like translates, I guess, to not writing throwaway songs. Like how do you avoid writing throwaway songs? I just, I've never been, like, if I write a lyric where I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel quite right, I'm not going to be like, whatever, I'll roll with it. Or yeah. like, let's put a filler lyric in here. Like, I, I, like, I don't do that. It's not really how my brain works. I would sometimes love to, yeah. you know, like, and sometimes I'm even like, ah, oh, I wish I could just write a pop song. Like, that'd be a fun exercise to write something more universal and easy. I feel like you did with I Used to Feel Different that's and that's such a wordy song <laughs> there's so many <laughs> words in that <laughs> Thank i think you, that, that's like very much to me like this this awesome pop song that's got like some grit to it for sure that's cool i'm glad to hear that it's funny that one we tracked it for um our last record i used to feel wild right i want i just want to be wild for you is and it was like a in six eight and it was a slow folk song oh like really really slow like <laughs> songwriter song yeah um and i just it was like six minutes long and like i was like i can't like do this like it doesn't it's too much of a slog and so we scrapped it and then on this round we were like what if we sped it up and made it a like a kind of a rock song and we tried that and it felt really good. So cut it down that. by half the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was really nice. Um, but it touched like you would not have heard the original and been like, this is a pop song. Yeah. <laughs> Masterpiece of trash. 
So it, it doesn't mean just because you're not writing throwaway songs or it, it doesn't mean that like songs sometimes don't get cut from a record. Yeah, exactly. We have cut songs from every record, but sometimes they make it on the next one. Yeah. Like you find often. that happens pretty often. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even for the very first EP. So the very first water bearer EP was five songs tracked ages ago and we um, couldn't find a place for someone's left their goddamn wallet. Like it just wasn't working. And then on Best Wishes, it we made it work. And then I think the one that got cut from Best Wishes was Wild For You, um, which then ended up being on the next record and being the title track of the next record. Yeah. And and then on this one, it was... So there's always one, and that's... A, that's I guess that's the thing, is like because I'm so neurotic about not writing throwaway songs, even if we can't figure a song out on one go-around, like on the next one, we're like... Ah, but I think we could find a place for this. Like, it shouldn't go away. It yeah. shouldn't just throw be thrown away. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it just uh, requires some some space from a song sometimes, or to be able to reimagine it? Like, what 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 sparks figuring out that I used to feel different should be this faster song? Is it just someone saying, yeah. "Hey, we should try it faster"? Yeah, totally. That's usually what it is. Or like not wanting to give up and being like ah like i really can we try this again like i just like feeling this like itch of like we we don't want to give up on a song and it's funny because those songs usually end up as historically they've ended up as like the sing like a single or like an important song on the next record yeah it's like it's funny how like maybe sometimes you need two passes to get it just right but once you get it right it's it's good yeah how do you feel like uh like where do you maybe recognize the most growth in your songwriting after having a a few records mm-hmm. under you? Mm-hmm. Well, um, one of them is e- economy and like not always needing to write a really long song, being okay with short ones. Um, all of the ones that I wrote for the songwriter challenge at the beginning of the year are very short because um, it just required being able to step away. Yeah, um, and I, I love I love a short song. I'm really appreciating that being able to tell a short story in a short amount of time. So that's one way. And another way is I think releasing the, the need for verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, you know, like I, uh, I grew up listening to a lot of no doubt and I learned how to write a song just listening to that band. And, uh, if you, there's always, that structure yep. and there's always a bridge and there's, yep. all, you know, every, and so I was like, that's what is required of a song. Yeah. I and, thought the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, especially on want this new record, we don't do that. Like if you listen to girl at the bar, like it's almost like there's acts and like it never returns back to where it started. Yeah. And I love that. Um, yeah. Do you feel like that's like also feels more authentic or like representative of how you're writing the songs or like the lyrics when you're talking about things, maybe not always being linear Mm -hmm. and maybe coming in fragmented. Totally. I think that, um, absolutely that there's like an emotional journey and that emotional journey. Yeah. Sometimes you don't repeat, like you don't walk around being like, no, I'm going to repeat the part (laughs) of my emotions where, uh, I'm, I'm happy. And this is like the fun part of the song, you know, like (laughs) it's, it's, I think things happen in acts very often in life. And, um, I got really into that on this record and it offers variation. And sometimes then you can write a straight song, like where you're just doing the whole structure. And I love getting to do both. Yeah. I think it also just leaves maybe some room for desire as a listener. Maybe sometimes when you go about things that way, you know, I think I very much had your, your experience of like feeling like a song needed to be the verse chorus verse mm-hmm. chorus bridge back to the the last chorus and then when i started hearing songs that were a minute and a half from a songwriter that didn't always find its way back to anything at first it was i don't know a little jarring or just like i'm like what is happening here i really wish that we could have gotten another chorus or something and now i love it and i'm i just feel like it it does leave me wanting more in some way and, and sometimes that's better. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know what, I, I mean, I remember growing up, like I'd hear certain songs where I'm like, 
I wish he I wish we could hear that part more. Like why did they save that part for the end and why does it only happen once, you know? Yeah. Um I feel that way all the time with songs. And on the one hand it's it's good to just leave that desire, leave them wanting more, don't hit them over the head with something cuz you might ruin it. Yeah. Um but the co- really cool thing about that then is if a part of a song really pops off and you realize that the audience loves it, like just play it twice live. Like yeah. and that's like becomes like the thing that is the treat for the person who gets to see you live is like they're like re- they get to like be surprised by the fact that like maybe the the favorite part of their song gets another go around yeah. you know and and that's like where the listeners like response to the music kind of starts to change the format of the performance i mean and that happens immediately like when you figure out like just by the time an album comes out you're like oh these are the popular songs on the record yeah we got to save these for strategic moments for sure so it's there's always that like evolution gives them that different experience you were talking about too with the live show Mm -hmm. like they played the chorus twice yeah exactly (laughs) we got to hear it again that's cool they played the first verse again at the end yeah (laughs) yeah exactly and it's like i love that surprise yeah absolutely are you uh ever writing lyrics without music i do actually i do a lot of um writing yeah yes i i do a lot of like if I'm standing around somewhere and I have a bunch of ideas, I'll just like jot them all down with like a very, like some kind of cadence into my phone. And so I have like pages and pages of like random lilting sort of lyrics. Uh, Then later I will write music and I'll just try to like shift them in and and grab pieces of them. I, I haven't ever really ever written a whole entire song without music. Um, and I, I think like the, for me, the cadence and, and fitting with lyrics and melody is so important. I think that's one of the things that is a strength of our band is, is the metric of, of the song and like how the words fit with the music. Yeah. So, and the having interesting chords and melodies. So that's always like a piece together. Yeah, do you find that a lot of those maybe original cadences that you're using while you're writing often make it into the songs? Or is it a lot of the time you're just kind of piecing together the puzzle and figuring out how to Mm -hmm. change those cadences? Sometimes they do make it in, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, it just depends. Sometimes they make it in, sometimes they don't. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this is a song. And then I'm like, oh, that doesn't fit with the chords. Yeah, And you have to adapt. And I did a lot of that. I I taught... uh, uh, Pendleton Rock Camp last week with the kids and there was a lot of that happening um, where we were teaching these 13 to 18 year olds how to like write a song and, and perform it in under a week with the with the band of kids <laughs> and uh, yeah it's like you have to be flexible like you might write a whole story and be like this is I not like this is the truth but for me I the way I operate is I I do feel like I try to serve the song. And so if the song needs me to change something, I will. And I'll even be flexible with feedback, like from my band members, you know, if one of them says this doesn't really feel like it's working, I don't really understand what you mean here. Like, I'm not going to say these are my words. Like I can't change them. Like I'm very much like open to feedback. Yeah. Uh, I also think that you're 100% right about what you're speaking about. Like as far as the, the band and the sound and those cadences like that is in my notes or just even listening to your music it feels like that is like what you've carved out as the mita sound (laughs) at this point cool after making some records you know like it feels like this uh uniquely yours Mm -hmm. and i i love the amount of words that you're (laughs) able to like put into certain verses cool yeah cool yeah yeah it's all i've it's always been that way i think Um, and we've just been able to hone it yeah is there uh i don't know it feels like very rhythmic to me Mm -hmm. in some ways like is there any sort of uh is there a drummer in you i wish (laughs) uh yeah i figured out a long time ago that it's much better to hire someone who's amazing (laughs) than than try to learn myself because it's you just there's only so much time in life yeah um i love i love dancing i love I just I love to move it's really important to me and I think it just comes really naturally having like that rhythm 
in yeah. my life. It's just a part of your your writing canon, mm-hmm. like you're you're feeling a rhythm when you're Yeah, in. yeah, totally. Um yeah, what was it like uh helping kids like learn songwriting and, and performing? Like do you feel like you had some sort of uh like approach in your mind that you thought would be effective or has there been some people that have helped you along that maybe informed the Mm. way you would help these younger people i for me um it was very free form i didn't really have a method and it really just depends on the kid like we had these like we would teach this songwriting workshop where we would do a song prompt and then some kids really respond to the prompt some of them don't and like i just try to listen to the to the kids and and take a different approach based on on each individual person um because they all need such different things so i feel like listening and i'm I'm like i do a lot of listening before i figure out how i want to interact with someone historically with kids you have to be a little quicker because they're (laughs) touch you know it's it's, you gotta you gotta get to it but like we had these three 13 14 year old boys who were like had formed this metal band and they were like shredders like they were awesome but they were in the songwriting class because you're supposed to write a song to perform at the end of the week and they were like deer in the headlights like we don't know what to write like we don't know like i don't know like i have nothing to say what do we do (laughs) you know and with them i was like that's fine write an instrumental song like it's totally okay you could say stuff without saying any words and uh we needed to redefine what a song means if that if that's the impression you're getting which is that like you can't perform your song if you don't have words and a meaning that is on paper you know and and then we had another person who like was just trying to figure out how to connect like she was like why do i respond to this fleetwood mac Mac song so well like what is it about this this is so beautiful and so like And then her being like, I really want to tell this very important story that's like very like intimate and emotional to me. And like, I don't know how to do it. And like just teaching someone like about metaphor and like how you can create a metaphor that runs through the whole song that can help anchor it if if it feels very personal and like just fine tuning it. Yeah. The the 13 year old metal boys need something different from the 18 year old songwriter. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody approaches or like learns those things so differently and Mm -hmm. I guess is going to express them so differently but yeah it's nice to like maybe like help somebody realize like you don't have words like maybe that's what you should lean Mm -hmm. into then Mm -hmm. and just not have words yeah yeah absolutely um what have you uh found helpful as a songwriter to like maybe get out of your own way at times time the time limit the parameter the weekly that was really helpful to like not labor over a song yeah. for a long time and be like i think also like i don't maybe feel a song is complete sometimes or i feel like it doesn't have that big like climax that the audience is going to need like i wrote a song that felt to me very quiet and very simple and i'm like well i mean i like what i'm saying here and i i feel like i've told the whole story i don't need to add any more but i don't yeah. know that it has that punch and then I played it, um, I did like a songwriter weekend at Doe Bay with a few other songwriters and they like were like, the, oh, we like the quietness of that song, like that's where it's powerful, like is how simple and small it is. <laughs> and learning that not everything has to be this intense work was important to me. Yeah. Do you get uh, a lot out of learning a a cover song at this point like i i love that version of dumb Mm -hmm. that you all put out like a few years ago yeah i thought that was so cool but like yeah what is your approach to putting out a cover of something so iconic as like a nirvana song Uh uh-huh i oh man i'm stoked that 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 i feel like that song has a lot of got like the best reception of (laughs) a lot of the songs that we put out (laughs) which is cool because it's yeah you're right it's so it's so iconic yeah like and people have covered it to death and i'm honestly like i think i was just playing around trying to learn electric like play more electric guitar and the arrangement just came to me where i was like oh this would be really cool and different and um 
And I, I want, I don't know. I just like, for me, if I don't have something new to offer to a cover, I don't really want to do it. Um, yes. And so I, I tend to like really enjoy covering songs in different styles if I can. Um, but I love learning covers. I really do. If I can come up with something creative and I love having a cover in the set, I think it's a good way for audiences to feel really connected, even if they don't know your music. Yeah. Um, I love if you love hearing it. You love hearing a cover. Why not give audiences that experience? Yeah. I my think, yeah my I, my big hang up is i just have a hard time choosing like, <laughs> it's so hard to pick a good cover well i think it's also really cool and maybe you hear one of your favorite bands play one of your favorite other favorite band songs out of nowhere mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so like i would imagine you know someone being at a Maita show that like loves your music and then all of a sudden you're like play Nirvana and maybe that's like their favorite yeah. band yeah. of all time or something. It's right. like you get this beautiful moment of these things coming together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You feel like it always teaches you a lot about songwriting too when you maybe break down a song like that? Totally. I learned everything I learned from listening and, and playing other people's songs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's how I absorbed everything. So... I yeah you learn stuff doing it for sure um and you're right like you reach you might make someone's day by playing something that is is important to them emotionally yeah you've been uh making records for a long time now and especially under this uh like as Mita mm -hmm. as this band how do you feel like maybe your um your ideas around success have changed or had to change um i think when you're young like super getting started and getting a lot of positive feedback for the first time you kind of have it in your head like the sky's the limit and you should you know yeah definitely but we've had a lot of roadblocks there's been a lot of stuff that's come up that you think you have momentum and then something comes along and you lose that momentum like covid or like uh just any there's so much that can change with the music industry it's constantly evolving i think that i know bands that are four or five times more successful than we are who still have to get day jobs to make ends meet you know or like they're they don't need them right now but in 10 years they will like yeah. it's like you have to get to such a wild level to have a career for your entire life without having to focus on something else and that is something that is always a difficult thing to f to balance and figure out and come to terms with, which is that like all we want to do is play music. And it's like it requires so much time and effort and money. And I like if I think about the thing that I can offer and I'm like the that like feels the best to me, it's music. But to know that that's that can't be your whole world, that you have to do something else as well. Like that's a big like it's a big wake up call, I think, yeah. that artists have in life and just understanding that it, it doesn't really ever get easier. <laughs> it's like no, it, does not. it just gets more complicated <laughs> yes. um, and you just have more jobs. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> You get rid of some of them and then you get more other jobs that come in, like just even as a musician. Yeah. So. Um, for me, success just means being able to continue to do the, the things that I love about music, like to have those peppered in to my life. That's success. Like if I can still like in 20 years be invited to go to a songwriter retreat at Dobe or like be invited to like even just like teach at rock camp for a week, you know, like there's certain things that just fill me my soul up yeah. um and that comes with being um in the arts and getting to be part of a community of other really creative people and to like come together and create something beautiful for ourselves and for other people i want that to be a part of my life forever and so for me success is anything that allows me to not walk away from that entirely you know absolutely very well said mm -hmm. um this has been so much fun. Thank yeah. you for taking the time to to chat with me. Thank you. It uh, was yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, yeah, the new record "Want" is amazing, and uh, I'll put all the links in the episode notes so people can 
keep up with the band and find uh, where you're playing and whatnot. And I want to play the episode out with the girl at the bar from the record. And Maria, we end every episode of the podcast with a guest saying the tagline for the show, which is it's a program and it means absolutely nothing. It's just my grandfather says the word program. He says program for some reason. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a goofy way to end the show. You can deliver it however you would like, whatever cadence you would like to okay. use, Maria. If we can get your it's a program, we can properly end this thing. All right. It's a program. She nailed it, everybody. It's Maria. Uh, check out Maita and check out all the records, not just Want. There's so many good songs in, uh, throughout the catalog of tunes. Do you remember anything specifically about um, writing Girl at the Bar? Uh, I remember that it was my favorite song that I wrote for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it just felt like everything just came together and I loved writing it. Yeah. What nice to have it out in the world then. Yeah. Right on. Well, thanks again for taking the time. And uh, that's the Jelly Jams. And we'll catch you on the flip side, Portland, or wherever you are listening from. Cool. We did it. We can be square. Yeah, that was great. Cool. I feel like I said song too many times, but you know. <laughs> what do you crave?